Well, on the first day, I put forward some some general ideas, some hand waving ideas about how to uh, think about electronic transport in a picture that was uh, involving only elastic scattering. Um, then, from that picture, we we took a turn towards uh, something that is more quantitative, or at least a theory that a uh, framework that can describe systems that are out of equilibrium for a more general uh, Hamiltonian. So in principle, we can think about a, a, a Hamiltonian that if we put it in some, some basis, we can describe electronic transport. The derivation was done for a non-interacting system, which is, which is easier. But as I said, the, uh, especially the current uh, and uh, the Green's functions that we defined are also can also be uh, used for for interacting cases. So at the very last, at the very end, if I have time, I'll talk a little bit about interaction. Ah, thank you. Um, but what I would like to do today is to go towards something more uh, quantitative, in a sense that we would like to make uh, predictions uh, without actually introducing any parameters, that would be our, 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 our wish, but as few parameters as possible in the sense that we can you know, build a system, tell where the atoms are, and then calculate electronic transport for this particular, particular system. Okay. <laughs> I didn't say anything. So, um, okay, so let's, let's go back to, to our problem. So we have a problem which in principle can have many terminals. Uh, we have a central scattering region, and we would like to uh, calculate transport through this, uh, through this device. So we, we define a, a current operator, or a, a current that is uh, the trace of, a, of an operator that gives us information about uh, incoming and an outgoing flow of electrons. Uh, and this is defined in terms of uh, the coupling between the, a central region and um, my particular electrode, and these lesser Green's functions, also in this particular case for, th for this, this coupling. And then we show that if we are in a non-interacting case, this, uh, this kind of very big framework that, that we devised, at the end of the day, reduces down to uh, butte landauer uh, the butte landauer approach for a multi-probe and a um, in principle, if you have a bias applied, then it's a it's bias dependent uh, transmission coefficient, which is given by this guy here. Okay, um, so so we can go back a little bit to our model to do a, f a final derivation, which is uh, we write down our current operator, and then in this uh, non-interacting picture, we can rewrite everything uh, by doing relationships between the lesser and the greater uh, Green's function and the lesser and the greater Green's function with their retarded advanced uh, terms. And assuming that, again, our electrodes are in thermal equilibrium, then we can do some algebra and write the current uh, in this form. Now, in the stationary state, this is actually true. So we have that the current flowing into the electrode, pro uh, into the molecule from the left electrode must be uh, the uh, opposite of what the current is flowing from the molecule out into the right electrode. And so we can choose uh, some, some uh, parameter x uh, to, to, um, to do some weighting. So this, this parameter is, a, is, a, is obviously an arbitrary choice that we can make. Uh, we can rewrite the current for this particular case. And we boil down the current to something that gives us a transmission. Uh, if we are working with a, a Green's function for just for a single site, uh, we get down to a transmission coefficient, which is a lo looks a lot like the um, the system that we had at the very beginning, right? So we had our, our very simple model where we had a single site, and we had a current flowing that it was a f uh, dependent on the product of the couplings between left and right electrodes and the uh, divided by the sum of this coupling, right? and this was uh, determining the size of our current. Right? So now we have an extra term, 
and this extra term is the essentially the density of state. So this is the uh, basically the, the imaginary part of the Green's function, which gives us the density of state. So again, what we're saying here is that although we we started off from a very very simple model, uh, that model uh, actually includes all the ingredients, or pretty much all the ingredients except for for this part here to describe uh, electronic transport. And so with this. We kind of combined everything, uh, you know, our, our kind of transmission, current from transmission approach with this uh, rate equation approach that we did at the very first lecture. Okay, so um, with this, I would like to do something more quantitative. Uh, and the question obviously is, can, can we do that? Can we, can we make quantitative predictions uh, using some form of uh, um, input to, to our problem that does not necessarily come from an experiment. So we want to really uh, do everything from what we would call first principles. And the question is the following. So once I set up my system, I can pick a Hamiltonian that will describe this particular system. And as I said, I mean, we, we set out this uh, big framework I used the Hamiltonian to describe my scattering region. I used a, a, a self-energy to describe the coupling to these electrodes, which is also given by uh, the Green's functions to the electrodes. So it's, it's described by the uh, uh, electronic structure of the electrodes and describing, describing the electronic structure of my scattering region. The question then is, can we uh, have a Hamiltonian that will somehow give us uh, a materials-dependent type of approach that uh, we can calculate uh, some, some um, uh, quantitative results for, for, for nanoscopic systems. And in actual fact, if we think about it, what we need is a Hamiltonian, a single particle Hamiltonian. Uh, we also need that this Hamiltonian responds to uh, charge distributions in my system. It should also respond to uh, the the application of a bias. And so there is a framework in which uh, everything boils down to a Hamiltonian that depends on the density because as I, sh as I showed you, I mean, I have a Green's function that describes the non-equilibrium density. So if I know how to calculate this non-equilibrium density, then in principle, I can plug it back into the Hamiltonian and do some form of self-consistent calculation. And so there is a theory for that. And this theory is known as density functional theory. So the basic idea is that within density functional theory, instead of using uh, the, the basic quantity to describe uh, electronic structure as being the wave function, which is typically what would one would do, uh, or the Green's function, that, that's what we've been doing so far, uh, the quantity that really describes all the electronic properties of your system is the charge density. Uh, this was proposed by Hohenberg and Kahn in, uh, in uh, 1964, and it's based on two uh, very fundamental uh, theorems, and these fundamental theorems are essentially saying the following. So what, what the first theorem is saying is that you can write any, um, any uh, observable as a functional of the charge density of your system. So by, by doing that, what you're saying basically is that all the observables of your system are, can be uh, obtained once you know the density of your, of your problem. And the second, uh, the second theorem says that uh, if there's a variational principle, that if we minimize this fun the, the energy functional with respect to the density, then the uh, density that gives you the minimum of energy is the ground state density of your system. Okay, now, this is all very nice. However, uh, within this formulation, uh, within the theorems, there is no prescription of what this functional is. Right? So, in essence, we have a very nice uh, mathematical theorem, but we cannot really do much about it in principle because we don't know how to calculate anything. Right? So next year, uh, 
Walter Kahn and, and Lu Sham, what they did was to actually formulate a way to go from a system of interacting particles, and you map this problem of, of a system of interacting particles into solving an equivalent system of non-interacting uh, electrons. And you do this by uh, writing a Hamiltonian, which is effectively a single particle Hamiltonian that will give you the same density if you find the minimum of energy of this Hamiltonian uh, that the interacting problem gives you. So we have a formulation which has a Hamiltonian. It's a Hamiltonian which is, in essence, a mean field, Hamilton a mean field single particle Hamiltonian that has this property that the minimum of energy of this mean field uh, particle Hamiltonian has the exact density of your uh, many body problem. Okay, that's great because now we have a Hamiltonian, and we have a Hamiltonian that is single particle. Uh, there are uh, various problems associated with, uh, with this Hamiltonian. However, I'll forget them for now and assume that I have a single particle Hamiltonian. And what is does this part, uh, single particle Hamiltonian looks like? It looks much, pretty much like a, a, a mean field uh, Hamiltonian. You have a, a kinetic term. You have... I didn't switch off the light, sorry. Um, you have a kinetic term. You have a, a hard to potential, which is essentially a classical interaction between uh, a density distribution of electrons and all the, in principle, all the n minus one electrons that are that is interacting with. Uh, there is uh, this term here, which I'll come back later, and then there is a later last term, which is uh, the external potential. So the external potential typically is the interaction of electrons with uh, the cores or the nuclei. Right? So it's it's the uh, interaction of the electrons with the uh, classical electrostatic potential of of uh, the the either the the bare cores or if you're thinking about uh, only the valence electrons of your problem, then is the uh, the sh the shielded core of, of your system, so it's the core plus all the other, uh, the, all the, the nuclei plus the, the, the core electrons. Now, the problem with this is that uh, although this is a very nice simulation, uh, this is a very nice uh, approach, what we need to do is we need to map this interacting problem into a non-interacting problem, and we don't know exactly how to do this. We need to find a way to uh, introduce all these interactions into this non-interacting uh, Hamiltonian, and we need then to include electron interaction, electron electron interactions in this, uh, this particular uh, part here. Actually, there's more to it, so you need to include also uh, the corrections to the, uh, to the kinetic energy of this uh, interacting, interacting problem. But uh, essentially, everything that you know, don't know exactly how to calculate, you put in, in here, in this exchange and correlation term. And then you need to do make approximations, right? So uh, there has been a lot of, of development into uh, making approximations to this exchange and correlation potential. It, depending on the material, you, you have to choose different approximations. And obviously, this is a problem. This is also a problem for uh, electronic transport. And you have to bear that in mind. So we have a Hamiltonian, but still we need to make approximations to this Hamiltonian to uh, calculate not only uh, transport, but all the electronic trans uh, properties of your system. Okay, but still, this is this is all very nice. So, what typically is done in density functional theory, which has become probably the workhorse of material scientists, and in physics is probably the the most widely used uh, uh, computational method for calculating electronic tr uh, properties. Uh, in chemistry, there is still a lot of, of people using uh, wave function methods uh, for various reasons, but uh, but but the the idea is is relatively simple. So you you take your Kohn-Sham Hamiltonian, which is now a a uh, functional of your density. You have a single particle Hamiltonian. You diagonalize this single particle Hamiltonian. Calculate the density of a single particle Hamiltonian is very easy because it's just a a, a single Slater determinant, you sum over the, all the states that are occupied, and then you know the number of, of particles, and then you obtain your charge density. From this, you can calculate a new Hamiltonian, and so on and so forth. 
So you do a self-consistent calculation and you have uh, the final Hamiltonian, you have the final states, you have the final density, and you have the total energy of your system. Okay, um, this is essentially what you could do. Now, in our approach, we don't want to diagonalize our system because, you see, we have an open system, so we don't really know how to diagonalize, but we found a way to calculate the Green's function. right? And from the Green's function, what I said was, okay, so I have the retarded Green's function, I have the advanced Green's function, and I have the lesser Green's function. And in particular, the lesser Green's function is actually associated with the uh, non-equilibrium density. right? So in equilibrium, it just boils down to uh, the, the charge density. But uh, out of equilibrium, it would be the equivalent of a non-equilibrium density. So in principle, instead of diagonalizing this guy, what I can do is I can uh, calculate this Hamiltonian and then calculate the Green's function for this problem. And then calculate the density. And then in this way, do a self-consistent procedure. So what does a system look like? Well, exactly the same as we've been, we've been playing with. Now, I'm going to do uh, things for a two-terminal uh, device, but it can be generalized to, to four terminals. Um, the basic idea then is that I have now a very complicated um, structure. So for example, here I would have uh, slabs of a metal uh, coupled to something that has, for example, a wire, a metallic wire, or it could have a molecule. Um, my, my, my region here could be a very complicated tip. No, so, for example, here you could be simulating exactly this system where it's being pulled and you have a forming of metallic wires, so your electrodes are actually forming a tip and then become, become the bulk. Okay. So, essentially here what we would have is you have a Hamiltonian, describing the left electrode. You have a Hamiltonian describing your scattering region, and you have a Hamiltonian that describes uh, your, your, um, your right electrode. And what we did until, until now was the following. So we showed that I can focus on the central scattering region, and I calculate the Green's function for the central scattering region, and this is given by uh, the non-coupled uh, Hamiltonian, so the non-interacting Hamiltonian for the central region, coupled to a quantity that uh, I call the self-energy, which couples the central region to the left and to the right. And now, the self-energy of the left and the right, what it contained was the coupling between the right and the left electrodes and the Green's function for uh, the semi-infinite uh, electrode to the left and the semi-infinite electrode to the right. Okay, so it seems like what I can do is reduce this problem to something like this. Uh, if we look in a more kind of pictorial way, this is, this is what we have. Sorry for the Portuguese. Um, now, the problem is it seems that I passed on the, the solution of this problem where now I only need to c worry about this guy to knowing how to calculate this term here and the Green's function for this term here. So in principle now what I need to do is to calculate a Green's function for a semi-infinite uh, uh, electrode both to the left and to the right. And in the same way that I don't know how to diagonalize an infinite matrix, I don't really know how to diagonalize a, a semi-infinite matrix. So Diagonalizing this, this guy is not really an e uh, a way to do, but I can calculate the Green's function for this, uh, this problem, provided that my electrodes are very well behaved. In the sense that what I mean by well, very well behaved is that uh, there is a prescription if they, are, um, if they are periodic. So if I build my electrodes as being a very nice metallic crystal, then uh, I can I can build I have a prescription to build the the um, the Green's function by knowing that whatever my next uh, next uh, layer of the crystal is is exactly identical to the previous one and in this particular case what I need to do is actually to build this uh, unit cell as being only coupled to the next unit cell so I assume that my unit cell has only coupled to this to its next nearest neighbors. Now, 
this might seem like I'm restricting my, my possibilities here, but the, the issue is that I can make this guy as large as I want. So in principle, what I can do is that if I have a, a localized basis set, then I can make this guy as large as I can to make sure that this, uh, the coupling between this uh, slab here uh, does not couple to uh, the next nearest slab. And, and uh, so basically means that this lab actually does not really contain a single atom, but it can contain quite a few number of atoms in it. Okay, so this is how my Hamiltonian looks like. So I have Hamiltonian, which is uh, because of this, uh, this uh, imposition that I made of having only nearest neighbor coupling, then it's a kind of a three diagonal Hamiltonian, but this diagonal is actually uh, not uh, not translationally variant because obviously I introduced a scattering region in the middle. So what I can do is because of this, um, <coughs> the fact that is is uh, semi-infinite but periodic, then I can uh, have a look at this uh, this structure here, and I can use a recursive method to calculate the Green's function. So what I can do is I can assume I can use Dyson's equation that we defined before. And we can as I can uh, can do the following. I can take a uh, a slab and then attach an extra slab and then attach the next slab and so on and so forth and calculate the Green's function for this lab. What what we'll see is that for this periodic system, the Green's function actually converges to a a a uh, semi-infinite slab at at uh, at some point. So it means that whenever you put the next slab, the Green's function for this one is exactly identical to the Green's function to the previous one, and so on and so forth. So uh, what essentially you realize is that by uh, doing this procedure where you construct from minus infinity all the way to this interface here, the slab one by one, uh, what you realize is that at some point you don't really need to do this anymore because you see that uh, your Green's function that you're calculating already converged. So this is quite quick. Uh, after a few of these iterations, you already find a, uh, a structure for this, uh, for this self-energy. And so uh, provided you have this kind of, this kind of uh, structure, then uh, this is, this is, uh, this is uh, assured. And you can really uh, boil down to looking only at this... Um, at the central region coupled to these uh, self-energies, which you can calculate. So, excellent, because I can, if I assume that my electrodes are very good metals, uh, what I'm saying is that no matter what I do uh, when I apply a bias, uh, the potential drop will happen inside the scattering region. And so, uh, when I apply a bias, what happens to my electrodes is that they will have the exact same electronic structure of the, um, of the uh, equilibrium situation, but shifted by some chemical potential. So shifted, shifting the chemical potential in such a way that you're, that's equivalent to applying the bias. Okay, so, so I know now how to calculate this. This can be done from an equilibrium calculation. And as I said, I mean, you can build this from a periodic system. All you require is the uh, the Hamiltonian for this lab and the coupling to its, to its nearest neighbors. And so I have information on how to build this structure. And this is the same no matter what is the potential that you're applying. And then this guy here actually then whenever you apply a potential, it depends on the charge density. So the charge density reorganizes. And so you need to know uh, what the uh, charge distribution is at each uh, at each uh, time you apply the, a different bias. But still, uh, because we have a single particle Hamiltonian, um, uh, what we have is that we don't actually, so we are in the spirit still of a mean field approach, so all we require is actually a retarded or the advanced Green's function. And so we can calculate the, the Green's function as the Green's function of the uncoupled system and those self-energies that we had uh, coming from the electrodes. Now from this, uh, and because this system is uh, non-interacting, then I can write the density of my problem, even in the non-equilibrium case. Uh, 
So the density of my problem is, interestingly, very similar to what I had in my very simple model, right? I have the coupling to the left, the coupling to the right, the, uh, uh, the, the chemical potentials of left and right, and now here you have these operators G and G dagger, the Green's function, but in, in essence, I mean, if you, if you think about it, if you multiply the Green's function, it's, it's, uh, it's a complex conjugate, you get something that lo looks very much like the density of states. So uh, basically, this is what you're saying here. So we're calculating uh, essentially a weighted average of the system coupled to the left electrode, the system coupled to the right electrode, and um, weighted by, by, the by, by the density of states as well. So it depends, obviously, whether you can actually populate a level in the, in the, in the system or not, in the, in the center scattering region. So again, we have the same kind of picture that we had in our, in our very simple model, now with you know, a lot more structure, but still the same idea. Okay, now you can do this self-consistently. So you take a, the, your Green's function uh, and you calculate your density. Then from this, you can calculate a new Green's function because this Hamiltonian now depends on the density. So depending on the applied bias, uh, you have a different, uh, a different iteration. And so you do this self consistently. Once you converge, then uh, again, you, everything boils down to calculating the current. And basically, this means calculating the uh, transmission. Now, because this guy here depends on the density, um, then the Green's function depends on the density as well. And also depends on the bias because these guys here depend on the bias. So uh, obviously, this means that the density depends on the bias. You have a, a bias-dependent density, and then the current can depend on the bias. Uh, has a has a non-trivial dependence on the bias, so it's not just can, can be non-linear in a sense. Um, okay, now how do we calculate the density? This is more like a technical uh, issue. So basically, what you need to do is to calculate the density is like integrating the density of states. Now, integrating the density of states, if you imagine, now we are talking about a system that has thousands of atoms, maybe hundreds of thousands of states. You need to integrate this from the lowest lying energy level up to something a little bit above the Fermi level. So in order to do this, you could do this numerically by discretizing your, your real axis and then doing this full-blown uh, calculation. But this is obviously something that is quite, uh, quite prohibitive. So what you can do is you can reorganize your density. You look at your, your equation for the density, you reorganize this density. And what you realize is that, for example, if you're in equilibrium, then the density should boil down to the imaginary part of the Green's function, so your density of states, uh, up to integrated up to the, chemi the, la the chemical potential. Now, when we apply a bias, what happens is that we don't have any uh, one single chemical potential anymore. We have a chemical potential from the left electrode, the chemical potential for the right electrode, but we can reorganize our equations and what we find out is that we have a term that looks very much like uh, a density which would be the equilibrium density of a certain uh, electrode, uh, so in this case the left, and then we have a correction to this, uh, this uh, density that is coming from the fact that we're coupling to the right electrode as well. Now. What is interesting about this is that this guy here is bound by the difference in chemical potential, so it basically uh, it only needs to be integrated uh, around a certain a certain energy. And this equilibrium density here, um, because because of of the fact that uh, the Green's function, the retarded Green's function, is actually analytical, uh, we can do a complex integral. So we can go to the complex plane, integrate this guy in the complex plane. Um, so you, you can choose the lowest bound, but the Green's function is actually very well behaved in the complex plane, so uh, you need a lot less points to do this integral, whereas if you have uh, the Green's function in the, in the real axis, then you can have uh, bound states, and then these bound states are, are very weakly coupled states, so they're very sharp, and you need to, in principle, have a very fine grid to, to integrate these. So in the real axis, well, in, in this term here, we don't, we, we can't really do much. We have to do 
uh, an integral in the real axis, but but still this is a uh, this is possible because we can do it integrating just over a, a very fine uh, fine region depending on the bias applied. In fact, I mean if you have zero bias, then this term has no contribution. Okay, so in essence, how is the calculation done? Um, a calculation is done in the following way. So first of all, we we have a, a system. We set up this this uh, this system in in a in a in, in defining where the atoms are. Uh, we calculate the self energies separate. So we set up what is the my electrode. We can calc do a calculation for a periodic system for my electrodes. And again, I mean uh, these are very good metals. We can then set and calculate. We know how this couples to the, my scattering region. I can calculate these self energies. Um, so in principle, my electrodes can be um, very realistic. Uh, once I do that, then I can calculate the. I, I I give an initial guess for the charge density. I calculate the the Kohn-Sham Hamiltonian. From the Kohn-Sham Hamiltonian and the knowledge of the self energies, I can calculate the Green's function. Then I calculate the density, and then I check whether this density is exactly the same or very close to the to the original guess. If it's not, then I can calculate a new density and so on and so forth until everything converges. And once everything is converged, then I can calculate the current. This has been packaged into one code that calculates electronic transport using the density functional theory. This is our code. There are other codes available. For example, TransSiesta, which is based on, uh, which you is, is bundled with Siesta. So our code also uses uh, Siesta, which is a density functional theory code for uh, using uh, localized states. Uh, what we can do, well, we have a lots of, of different features. Um, we can do periodic systems. We can do finite systems like molecule. Uh, we can go to very, very large systems. So the idea is to calculate uh, things which have a uh, few thousand atoms. Uh, in principle, you can do uh, dynamics. And in particular, you can do non-equilibrium dynamics. So you apply a bias. You apply a, and you calculate the, the non-equilibrium forces that are induced by the fact that you have a bias on your on your system. Uh, uh, you can calculate, for example, spin transfer torques as well, which is also uh, uh, an non-equilibrium property. Uh, we can do things like different flavors of this exchange and correlation potential. Uh, so essentially, you can do corrections to the exchange correlation potential to describe different problems uh, that might arise from the kind of vanilla type of, of exchange and correlation potentials. And you can also do things like, for example, I, I can simulate uh, systems where I excite an electron to a, an excited state, uh, which is very interesting for calculating, uh, for example, organic solar cells. Uh, this is done using this methodology called constrained BFT. Um, OK, so I, I, I would say, excellent, we're done. We solved all the problems in the world. Uh, you know, you can, like, put your atoms there and you can use Gaussian to kind of play around and make it, you know, a very nice molecule and, and attach it to electrodes and say, yeah, calculate the current. And then you get a, get a number. Uh, uh, pff, sorry. It's not really that simple. Um, so I would like to make you believe that, you know, by doing this combination of, of DFT and, and uh, non equilibrium Green's functions, uh, we have a, a, a very good uh, description of transport, and it works in some cases, but there are some kind of fundamental problems and also some practical problems uh, which, which, um, which are come up, especially in these molecular systems. So in many of these molecular systems, we have these kind of uh, problems. For example, uh, first of all, we, we don't know what is the exact uh, exchange correlation. That's one problem. So uh, in many cases, uh, the exchange correlations that are available lack a property that is quite quite uh, significant, especially if you have like these few electron systems, which is the lack of a what, what is known as a derivative discontinuity, which means that basically my potential has uh, uh, I if I take my system and I start putting uh, fractional amounts of charge into an empty level, 
then uh, basically my system will actually allow me to do that. So DFT would allow me to introduce fractional amounts of charge into, into my molecule, whereas if you think about it, what you need, would uh, actually try to do is that if you attach your electrodes uh, to, to your molecule to electrodes and you try to put some fractional charge, the, the level should not really be moving uh, um, continuously, but it should move in steps. In the in the limit of very 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 weak coupling, which is essence the essence of Coulomb blockade, for example. So so basically, you miss all the physics of Coulomb blockade uh, by by doing this. Also, there is also a more fundamental problem that we are taking a single particle Hamiltonian, but the single particle Hamiltonian is not the single particle Hamiltonian of this, of your problem, right? It's a single particle Hamiltonian for a problem that is equivalent to uh, the many-body problem. It's only equivalent via this charge density. It's, it's no, there's no guarantee that it, it is really the true single particle description of your, of, your, of your system. So in essence, what I'm saying is that the Consham eigenstates are not really the uh, single particle eigenstates of your, of your many-body problem. And they're often uh, uh, wrong. They're often wrong. Uh, in many cases, because of this practical problem that you have no exchange correlation potential, but at the same time, uh, there's no fundamental guarantee that they should be uh, the uh, single particle excitations of your system. Uh, there are also other problems that are that are associated with with uh, this approach. For example, uh, there is no there is no in, in the same the, the way that DFT has a a variational principle. Here, there is no variational principle. So there's no guarantee that, for example, you might get two different solutions if you start from two different initial gases for your, for your charge density. And uh, there's no guarantee or there's no way to make a choice between the two, the two, uh, these two currents. Or there's no way to actually, uh, there's no guarantee that whatever current you get, this is the actual current that uh, is actually passing through, through your device. Uh, there are other problems, for example, uh, that derivation of the density does not handle uh, bound states. So if I have a state that is, is very, very weakly coupled within the bias window, then uh, there, is, there is a term missing in that, in that derivation which should account for these, for these bound states. Uh, and obviously, uh, we're taking a ground state theory, which is DFT, at zero temperature, and then saying, okay, I'm actually putting a chemical differences in chemical potential and taking it out of equilibrium and then in and also ap uh, applying a bias. And there's no there's no guarantee that you know this theory should still hold when you go to these uh, extreme cases. However, uh, well, you should have this in mind uh, when, you're, when you're doing the calculations. So it, there is a pinch of salt. But in many cases, many of these cases, is the same pinch of salt that you have to take when you're doing a calculation using density functional theory. Right? So when, you, when people calculate a band coming from density functional theory, um, then Obviously, the band is calculated from the Consham eigenstates, so you're assuming that the Consham eigenstates are the single particle excitations of your of your problem. This comes with all the problems of a, of a, a underestimated gap. Typically, it comes with uh, changes that might occur because you you don't have these uh, these single particle excitations. Obviously, is not the optical gap of your system because. Uh, because it's a it's a ground state property, so all of these things uh, that are present in ground state DFT that people actually present in papers is also present here with a few more problems. Right, so these are things that that people have to bear in mind when uh, when they're doing this. But anyhow, I mean, the last uh, uh, ten minutes or so, I'd like to uh, give you a pinch of how to um, how to introduce interactions in this. So. Up until now, what everything we did was to uh, to treat in everything in a mean field approach, um, and one way to introduce interactions would be going back to the equations and calculating uh, 
everything that we did uh, uh, and deduce everything from, from uh, an interacting picture. Uh, that can be done. And in actual fact, the equations look very similar. Uh, what we require to do is that whenever we have our retarded Green's function, then what we can think of is that interaction, for example, electron phone interaction or electron electron interaction, can be introduced by, by doing uh, something that is analogous to, uh, to what we did for the electrodes. So in the electrodes, what we have is, is we calculate a quantity for the electrodes and we introduce the effect of the electrodes via a self-energy. So in, in fact, we can calculate or we can propose that the, uh, the Green's function how has another correction which comes in due to these electron-electron uh, interactions or these electron phone interactions in terms of a self-energy. And this will correct the Green's function. It will also correct the, the density. So all the quantities that we had, so we had a, there are, are, are retarded or advanced, our um, greater and lesser Green's function, they, there will be terms which are, uh, again, associated with this, with this interaction. So there will be a retarded self-energy for the, the the interaction, there will be an advanced self-energy, there will be a lesser self-energy and a greater self-energy. Now, the problem then comes in is that how do you calculate these self-energies, right? So how do you actually find a way to calculate uh, the self-energies in such a way that you can at the end, very end calculate a, a current? And typically what you can do is calculate the current using still butiker landauer but what I'll, I'll show you at the very end is that in actual fact, even this equation here needs to be corrected uh, to account for interaction. So the equation that we had before this one, uh, it was exact, but then whenever we, we introduce interactions, there will be corrections to, to this, uh, to this uh, current uh, flowing through the device. Okay, let's, so let's take uh, one example. And the example uh, that I would like to take first is electron phonon interactions. And the basic idea is the following. So in, uh, in the previous, in the up until now, what we were saying is that you have an electron. Oop, have an electron. It comes in. Uh, it somehow flows into a state in the molecule. And uh, then flows out into the uh, right electrode. And if the bias is right, then... Uh, this is possible, otherwise poly uh, exclusion principle prevents me from, from current to flow. So this, this would be the contribution. Now, if I include electron phone interactions, then there is a, uh, the possibility that my uh, electron that it went into, for example, this state here, uh, will emit a phonon uh, if this energy here is the energy of, a, of a one of the vibrational modes of my system. We will emit a phonon, and then the electron actually go down to this uh, level here. And then, again, if this level it lies within my, my bias window, then actually the electron can flow out of the system, or if this level is, is empty here. Now, okay, so now I introduce an extra, an extra degree of freedom from my problem because in principle, provided I have uh, a way of giving these phonons, so I have a phonon bath that will give or absorb these phonons, then uh, my system can actually either absorb or emit phonons, and it can play around levels here inside my molecule. Um, and so it can actually have situations where there would be energies which would be forbidden because of that, of that window but which are available via these transitions. Right. Okay. Uh, so how do, we, how do we model this problem? Uh, the, first, uh, the first way to model this actually was proposed by, by, uh, by Marcus Butiker, and the idea is, okay, if I think about my problem in a, in a, in a very simple way, um, I can think of, of the problem in this, in this sense. So when you introduce phonons uh, into your problem, there will be this transition, but there will also be some, some form of dephasing. So the, the electron will actually lose information about, uh, about its phase. So this is similar to what happens when you have an electrode. So 
when I have an electron, electrons flowing from this guy it from into a scattering region and into this region here, what happens is the moment the electrons uh, uh, get into the electrode, then it needs to terminalize. So it loses all the, the, uh, the, the phase information that it had after it passed through the, the scattering region. Now, this is what I would like to do then to introduce some form of dephasing, is I can introduce some fictitious electrode which has the following property. It has the property that electrons might flow into this electrode, lose its phase information, and will move, will flow out in such a way that obviously the current here has to be zero, right? Because if I am at steady state, whatever comes in, even though the electron loses energy, it has to come out. Right? So I have a constraint. I can introduce a fictitious probe that has the constraint that the total current has to be zero, flowing in and out of this of the system. Okay, I can do this uh, for a more complicated system. I can then introduce these probes uh, in various ways. For example, I can go to each one of my sites and introduce a small probe uh, to my problem um, and guaranteeing that my current is zero uh, flowing uh, in and out of these probes. This becomes a, a um, nonlinear problem because now what I need to do is to solve for, this, for these probes and the, the idea is that you can change the chemical potential of these probes in such a way that this, is this current, uh, current uh, condition is satisfied. So the current through in and out of these probes is equal to zero, so adds up to zero. And then I can calculate the total current including these uh, fictitious probes and becomes actually an electronic problem trying to mimic uh, a, dephasing, a dephasing problem. So the effects of phonons uh, in dephasing. Um, okay, so, but the problem is that in this, in this situation, what happens is that, well, I'm basically introducing some, uh, in, in essence, what I'm doing is introducing a small imaginary part on my, on my diagonal terms of my Hamiltonian. So I, I am broadening the levels of my system. So I didn't really introduce any, any structure to the phonons. So the phonons here in this very simple model have no structure. But still, what I did here was essentially introduce this, a self-energy, right? But this self-energy now is uh, just a, a constant times the, the chemical potential of this system. Um, what, uh, what, uh, what if I want to uh, introduce some structure? Then obviously I need to, to, to uh <coughs> solve a, a many-body problem. And my problem is I can go back to my Hamiltonian and introduce some form of interaction. For example, I couple my Hamiltonian to a phonon bath, and the coupling is uh, given by this coupling matrix M. Uh, and so essentially what I need to do is I need to find the normal modes of my system and find a way to calculate this, uh, this coupling matrix. Uh, this can be done for example, using DFT, so you, there's a, a way of calculating this coupling matrix based on the normal modes and how the Hamiltonian changes if you make small changes to the uh, to the to the system. So if you make some small small vibrations to your system, now this is within uh, uh, um, an harmonic approximation, but but uh, still this is uh, this is a fairly good approximation. So provided this coupling matrix is small. What I can do is I can uh, I can do a perturbative approach, right? So first of all, I I if I have non-interacting phonons, I can write down the Green's function for uh, this problem. So it's uh, relatively easy to do. I can do this for the retarded Green's function and for the advanced and uh, the lesser and the greater Green's functions. So the problem is that if I want to go to non-equilibrium, then Calculating these are, are is much more complicated. Actually, even in equilibrium, calculating the self energy is not really a, a simple issue. But what what I assume for now is that even in out of equilibrium, I will still have a, an equilibrium phonon population. Okay, so then you can do a diagrammatic expansion of your of your self energies, and obviously then in principle, if 
provided again that your coupling is small. You can go to any uh, any level of, of of diagrams. Just keeping the simplest the simplest ones, uh, which uh, if we do a a just a single shot calculation on these on these simple diagrams, uh, this is known as the firstborn approximation. Now within the the firstborn approximation, uh, you have two terms, uh, what we call Hartree and Fock, and the Hartree term and the Fock term, the important point here is the following. So you have a, a dependence on the coupling. So it's the first, uh, the f the first, uh, the first order coupling. So in actual fact, you have a, a quadratic dependence on the, on the coupling. Um, but the important point here is that this self-energy now depends itself on the uh, lesser and greater and retarded and advanced Riemann's function of the system. So I have a system which is coupled to the phonon bath, but the cup, the self-energy, which is the effect of the bath onto the system, actually depends on the system itself, which was different than the system where we had the electrodes, right? So in the electrodes, all I needed to care about was the structure of the electrodes here. These self-energies actually depend on the system itself. So if I think about it, uh, if I do a correction or I calculate this guy here, then in order to calculate this term, it depends on both these, uh, all of these self-energies. So, basically, what I'm saying is that I can, I, the the correct solution, even for this uh, Born approximation, would be to do something that is self-consistent within uh, these uh, these Green's functions here. So this is what's known as as the self-consistent Born approximation, um, and you can you can uh, rearrange everything uh, within the the first born approximation, or if you're doing the self-consistent born approximation, then uh, this is not just G zero, but it's uh, this uh, dressed uh, Green's function. But the important point here is the following. So if you look at the how these uh, Green's functions look like, they have all these uh, these terms uh, for Fermi distributions, which I put L plus L minus L r plus and r minus, which mean basically the following. So you have an energy, and then you shift down this energy by a, uh, a phonon, so a h bar omega, which is the frequency of the phonon. So basically what we're, we're saying here is exactly this. So you, you allow now for transitions between uh, one particular energy and one uh, phonon upwards or one phonon, phonon downwards. So this is exactly what we're saying here. We have uh, basically the density of states and the coupling and these uh, these quantities here, which allow you for these for these transitions. And then obviously, you can either emit or absorb the phonon. So this is how these guys look like. They're not obviously not e very easy to calculate, um, but uh, but it can be done. Uh, it, there there are tricks to 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 do these calculations so you can do it uh, in this way. There are, there are other expansions, like for example, the lowest order expansion. I don't know if Mads is going to talk about, uh, about that. But um, there will be, uh, you, can, uh, you can then in principle uh, do this expansion and introduce these effects uh, into the non-equilibrium approach. Now, the problem is that M must be small, and this is very many, many cases that's not the case. So uh, obviously, then you have to look for uh, different approaches to do this. Another possible approach is actually to uh, do the full uh, space. So you, you do actually a calculation using your still kind of butiker landauer spirit, but now you have a, a space that includes electrons and, and phonons. So that's another possibility. Um, but, uh, but in principle, you can introduce these kind of uh, interactions. And now what, uh, what happens is that the current in this uh, in this approach, so if we go back to the definition of the current, then the current is not just uh, butiker landauer Now, this Green's function here actually have um, have the information about the interaction with phonons. So they have uh, the the self energies of the phonons in included in them. So there is some uh, electron phonon effects here, but there is obviously this inelastic term here, which is also the contribution coming coming from the phonons, uh, 
And this will occur both for electron-electron and electron-phono interactions. Now, just to, just to finalize, so how does the spectral function then look like for, for something like this? You start to get these structures where you have uh, more than one peak. So if you imagine my single particle problem, what you, what you, what you would have is you would have just a, a resonance at the, at, the, um, at the single particle energy level. Now, if you start to include uh, either the first-born approximation or the self-consistent born approximation, then uh, what you start to see is that there is a contribution that is coming from that, uh, that Hartree term, which is just a, s a shift uh, of, your, of your energy level, which is uh, these ones here. And then at the same time, uh, you start to see these peaks here, which are associated with either emission or absorption of phonons. Um, there are subtleties associated between uh, the first born approximation and the self-consistent born approximation. One important fact, for example, is that uh, the first born approximation actually does not conserve current. So you need to go to the self-consistent born approximation to, to have a uh, current conservation. Um, so this means that in principle you have to do everything self-consistently for 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 your for your equations to be to be closed. Um, and how a current uh, current looks like is you have so if we imagine again now here my site is really at the at the very uh, at at zero. So the moment I start to apply a bias, I start to conduct, which is this one here. Then if I go to my, my very, very simple model and I only introduce that dephasing term, then essentially what I'm doing is I'm broadening that level. So basically the current actually just, you just see that the current will actually uh, increase quicker than this one because now you have more, uh, at very low uh, bias, you have more, you, you're able to, to well, the, the peak is, is decreasing, so the current is, is smaller. And, but whenever I, I introduce these corrections, then the peaks actually shift position, so you start to see that the current is only flow, starts to flow at a, at a later time, and uh, the, the, the peaks are actually sharper, and the effects of the phonons will only occur here, so if you actually take the second derivative of the, of the, of the IV, then you start to see the phonon peaks whenever you actually start to hit these phonon peaks at the, at the very end. Okay, um, I think I have very, very little time, so I wanted to talk to you about electron-electron interactions. Um, the idea is the same, so you can introduce this via some, some self-energy approach. Um, before, before, uh, before going that direction, so the simplest way to introduce uh, uh, electron interaction, electron electron interactions in a in a simple model, I would say is the it is the Anderson impurity model. Um, so we, we include a, a U term with uh, some some density uh, density operators for for the for the interaction. Um, <coughs> the key point here is that if we if we take another approach, which is this approach for uh, using uh, uh, expanding the, the equations of motion, uh, what we get is we can do an expansion of, of, of the equations of motion. So you can do first order, the then second order, and so on and so forth. So for example, this is the Green's function with first order. So you really start from the, the uh, kind of the many body, many body uh, operators. Uh, kind of the second order term uh, starts to become more and more complicated. We start to introduce correlation effects. The key point here that I wanted to show you is that uh, the, the, the how does this Green's function looks like is that you start to have something that looks very similar to you have the original non-interacting system with a self-energy. So you get the same spirit, even though you're doing this expansion from a different approach, you get the same spirit that is uh, the electron-electron interactions or the interactions in your system are introduced via some uh, some self-energy. So the key point is how to calculate the self-energy. Uh, one possible way to do this is to use uh, something that will include electron-electron uh, interactions. So provided I give to some some uh, very uh, advanced many-body many-body uh, method, uh, the 
some information, then I can get back this, uh, this uh, interaction self-energy for the single particle. In this case, for example, we can do uh, dynamic mean field theory. Um, the, the one of the points is if we're doing density functional theory, so what we're doing here is the following. So in principle, I have a Hamiltonian, which should include all the, uh, all the important effects. Right? So it, it should be, in principle, a Hamiltonian that is exact. Now, the, the point is, obviously, we don't have a very good description of, of, the, of the exchange of correlation, but we have some description. Right? And, and so if we're going to include electron-electron in interactions, there is some already some electron-electron interactions included inside this uh, exchange correlation potential. So in order to avoid a double counting problem, so counting twice this uh, interaction, I can remove uh, somehow this effect. And for example, we can do a, a uh, remove the double counting using LDA plus U uh, from, th from the problem. And, and then you can calculate using dynamic mean field theory this term here. And the idea basically behind dynamic mean field theory is that you take your Green's function, you project onto this uh, site that you believe that is the interacting part of your problem. You calculate a function that is known as the hybridization functional. And once you have this hybridization function, then you, you can calculate the the uh, interacting problem, which is you only require is this hybridization function, which is essentially the coupling between your non-interacting part and your interacting particle. You're required to introduce some uh, interaction via a, a U. So we introduce by hand this Hubbard U. And then uh, once you do that, then you get back your your electron-electron interaction self-energy. Now, this needs to be done self-consistently because, again, the Green's function depends on the on the sky, and so you but you use the Green's function to calculate the self-energy. So this this can be done self-consistently, but again, you have a prescription to calculate the uh, the electronic properties of a system with the presence of one or n, n interacting sites. Okay, so in essence, what uh, what we did here was. Ah, okay, so just to have an idea of what uh, it looks like for a single impurity problem. Um, so if we calculate a chain of atoms with a, with a single impurity that has only just one level, so I have a chain of atoms with some structure, so in this case is a gold chain. So I have the, the transmission of the perfect chain would be uh, this one here, so I have can have many channels. So I have many channels arriving into this, uh, this single impurity. So in within DFT, what you would get uh, if you impose that the system has no uh, spin polarization is you will get a resonance uh, at zero energy. So my energy level is actually pinned at the at the Fermi level. That's because I'm imposing that my my particle has a, an occupation of one. Now the the point is, if you go to the spirit of mean field, then uh, the value of u that you have here, the the effective value of u that uh, LDA will give you, uh, actually will spin polarize the system. So even though there should be no spin polarization in the in the in the Hubbard, uh, the Hubbard mean field will give you a spin polarization, and uh, this is essentially what you see here. So you actually get a transmission that is split. However, uh, you can clearly see that this is in actually not in one con quantum of conductance, but a half a quantum of conductance. Now, if you do dynamic mean field theory, then you also see a split, but uh, this split is really coming from the fact that you have the interaction. So the point is that whereas in a single particle Green's function, you will never get this uh, multiple peak structure that you would uh, require to see uh, this, this split here in a non-spin uh, polarized system, uh, the introduction of this self-energy coming from the electron-electron interaction will give you this, uh, this, uh, this splitted uh, peaks and then you get a split uh, transmission coefficient uh, that is really at the two quantum of conductance level. Yeah, yeah I, I finished actually. So just to take home messages, 
So hopefully by the end of these lectures you have an idea that we can have a lot of, uh, 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 have a very powerful tool to calculate non-equilibrium non transport, electronic transport, and using a combination of these DFT and non-equilibrium non Green's function, you can do very material specific systems. So with this, I thank you very much. <laughs>